Hi everyone, it's Sandra. I'm gonna be checking in on my dried out cocoon bin. I'm trying to revitalize some cocoons that were inadvertently left outdoors through the summer in some dry potting soil. I have worm props, so let's see what's happened. But importantly, also let's look to the science to see how it might be able to help us. I've already looked at research that looked at the temperature range under which cocoons might be most successful. And I have no problems with the temperature range. I actually have brought the cocoon indoors, the cocoons indoors, so everything's fine from my end, but I thought that would be informative. So in terms of temperature range, we found out that at about 10 degrees Celsius or 50 degrees Fahrenheit, worm cocoons are just gonna go into stasis and they could be in a very prolonged stasis but stay viable, which means those wisps, when given suitable conditions, which is warming to about 20 degrees Celsius or about 68 degrees Fahrenheit, in only 14 days, those wisps would start emerging. So that's reassuring for those of us that have outdoor bins like I do through the winter, that you're gonna see a big boost in worm um, maturation, worm cocoon maturation, when the bedding temperature, not the air temperature, when the bedding temperature warms into something closer to 20 degrees Celsius or 68 degrees Fahrenheit. I also looked at the microbe mixture of worm cocoons or the microbiome, the whole signature of what is in the cocoons and what is around the cocoons. And my worm research showed that there's a handshake that happens that the microbes from the outside can actually go down that little tunnel of the worm cocoon and signal the cocoon itself it's time to mature conditions are right on the outside now just imagine in dry conditions the microbe mixture is going to drop not as many bacteria and fungi and they're not going to be as active so that signature isn't going to happen those wisps are not going to emerge when conditions are too dry. Similarly, that's going to happen when conditions are too cold. Microbes slow down. That's why we have refrigerators and freezers. Microbes slow down in colder temperatures. So that little signature coming down the tunnel is not going to be adequate for those cocoons to mature. That's why they kind of go into that holding pattern until the vermicompost bedding temperature warms up. Similarly, at hot temperatures, you're not going to find as many microbes survive. That's why we heat food up and we don't get food poisoning. We kill off the bacteria. And so at hot temperatures, that little signature coming down is not going to be adequate enough for those cocoons to mature. All of these are built-in mechanisms to ensure the maximum survivability of those cocoons. They're simply not going to mature when the conditions aren't right. So my prop today is a worm. It's a blue worm, I guess. But what I want to show is the worm and the clitellum and what happens. Sorry, I didn't have enough socks to build two worms. What happens when a cocoon is sloughed off by the parent worm? Now, the cocoon is formed on this worm with the exchange of the egg and the seminal fluid from the two worms forms a cocoon and it forms under this clitellum. And so here's my little yoga ball goes under the clitellum. And so the cocoon actually forms under the clitellum of the worm. So it contains microbes that both the, the other parent and this worm parent donated to that cocoon. So as the cocoon forms, it uses material from both parents. Therefore, it has the microbiome of both parents contained in that cocoon. That isn't the DNA. The DNA is something different, and that obviously is in there as well. But what happens is the microbes from both parents are in that cocoon. But as you know, you've seen that little pinched off tunnel of cocoons. So as the cocoon comes out and is sloughed off, let me just push this out right there, and is sloughed off by the worm, 
and that little tunnel seals off as the cocoon goes out into the mixture, it grabs a little bit of the microbiome of the surrounding vermicompost. Okay, so most of the bacteria and the fungi are coming from the two parents, but some of it right at the point of the cocoon being pushed off comes from the surrounding environment. So fast forward to a thriving, healthy worm bin. The two parents live in the environment. They mate and both of them form a cocoon and those cocoons contain a tiny little fragment of the surrounding microbiome as well as a lot of the microbiome from each of the parents. That, the, the totals of those three sources, the two parents and a little bit from the surroundings, is about 75% of the bacteria and the fungi that are found when the researchers open up cocoons. The other up to 25% is that handshake that I talked to you about. The handshake that comes in right at the point of signaling the cocoon that it's time to mature, it's safe for the wisps to emerge. So let's imagine you have a thriving worm bins that both parents live in the bin, they mate, they slough off cocoons into the bin, and about you know, 21, 23 days later, Icinia worms would emerge, the wisps, into more or less the same environment. The micro mixture of that worm bin is not gonna substantively change unless you did a harvest or something in that 23 days. So that's the way the perfect world works. Certainly out in the wild, you could see cocoons being deposited 20 odd days later, wisps emerging, no huge change. The signal coming down the tunnel is gonna say everything's great, time to come out. Now let's look at some extreme environments. I'm obviously testing an extreme environment with my dried out cocoons in this little mini experiment, but even out in the wild, the adults mate, two uh, cocoons are sloughed off, but fall temperatures are approaching. And just like you might be able to see, leaves are falling outside. You've got cooling temperatures that signature coming into the cocoon is, it's a little chilly, I wouldn't emerge right now, not enough microbes out here. The cocoon goes into stasis through the winter. When the bedding, which in this case could be the wild uh, leaf litter on the forest floor, when it finally warms enough that those cocoons get the signature, it's time to mature, the the whole microbiome of that environment is going to be different than the microbiome at the end of the summer season. And so this is where the research today that I'm looking at shows that when you substantively change the environment for cocoons from the environment that they were first formed on that parent, it's going to take longer for those cocoons to mature. Now, that makes sense, right? The cocoons contain a microbe signature from the bedding and the parents. And if everything stays the same, the clock ticks just as it should. Cocoons mature on their predetermined timeline, that 20 odd days. If you substantively change, maybe you do a harvest, maybe you buy cocoons, and those cocoons have been flown through the air and you're putting them in far different environment. You've got, of course you have a different microbe signature to whatever you put them in. If you put them in a bin with only other cocoons, I've told you in my previous video, you need to get some microbes in there. In fact, what I did is I introduced a nanny worm into this container that we'll be looking at in just a second. And that is, a way to get the microbes in that little mini bin, in my case, starting to build up. So if you put cocoons that you've bought into a bin with no microbes, you're gonna be waiting a long time for those wisps to emerge. If you put some nanny worms in there or put them into a thriving worm bin, 
that's going to be faster, but it's still not going to be fast enough or fa as fast as if those cocoons had stayed in the bin where their parents were in familiar environment. So it might be an idea if you are buying cocoons or you're just transporting your own cocoons from one environment to another to take some of that environment along with you so that the microbes of the new environment mimic or emulate the, the uh, conditions where the cocoons were first formed. Now, if you buy them from a breeder and they've been shipped through the air, you might want to inquire what was your bedding? Was it cardboard? Was it coconut coir? Was it cow manure? What is the constituent ingredients of the bedding? And the researchers say even the food sources will have different microbe signatures and those cocoons will recognize same versus different. When it's same, they get them, they have the microbes that will recognize that and go, yep, that's good. If it's different, then they're going to go, hmm, they have to evaluate whether those conditions are good for the cocoons to mature. In terms of my little bin, I put coconut coir in here because I didn't want to introduce any living material. Naively, I didn't know that worm cocoons need a microbe signature to mature. So for the first three or four weeks, I kept these cocoons in basically a sterile environment other than a little bit of um, banana juice that I dribbled in there. Not enough microbes for those cocoons to recognize there's something on the outside. Also, I never use coconut coir in my worm bins, so this is a totally different bedding to what the worm cocoons where they were formed and any of the microbes that the parents might have donated to them. I didn't know this. So had I known this, I probably could have you know, really gone through some compost or worm bin material to make sure there are no cocoons in it and given these cocoons, these dried out cocoons, a more similar environment to the one that they were used to, at least microbially similar. And right on the top, I see a cocoon that is looking pretty transparent. Okay, I'm seeing whole intact cocoons. Oh, that one, is that one? This one, these two have got to be ready to mature. Those were totally transparent, those cocoons. I don't want to squeeze them because I actually think that something might have been happening there. Oh, here's Nanny. She's getting bigger. Whoa. She was a juvenile when I put her in because I wanted to put in a pre-breeding worm. And so she is growing. Look at that. Nanny, you're doing a good job. You can see the castings right in the length of her body there. So she is laying those down everywhere she goes. She's now trying to escape because she's mad at me. So she's got castings down the length of her body and those castings will be deposited into here that will increase the microbial mix. Now the rotting food also is a source of microbes. It's just that the worm research that I consulted said that there's something about the worm's presence in the material, an adult worm presence in the material that lays down or gives the microbes a distinct signature that the cocoons will recognize. And that handshake then facilitates the maturation of the cocoons. Nanny, I'm not going to give you any more food. You've got that kiwi to eat. Oh, but what I will give you is I will give you I will give you some eggshell grit because uh, I haven't done that since the very beginning and I only put a tiny bit in because it was really just cocoons at that point. Now, 
we don't rinse our eggshells, so they will still have a little bit of egg protein on them. And I do bake them, but the protein will still be intact. So that also is a food source. If you don't rinse your eggshells, the worms get a little bit of protein from that. All right, Nanny, do your job. Hopefully by the next check-in, those transparent cocoons will show some signs of life. All right, everyone. Thanks for coming along. Bye for now.